Good evening, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all this evening for tonight's event, Colour at Play. My name's Margaret Cubbage. I'm one of the exhibition curators here at, at REBA, but I also curated the, um, the series of talks, Well Being, Well Built, which is in partnership with Vitra. It's a programme that explores how architects and designers can shape the environments and spaces we inhabit to create places that enhance our sense of well-being, both physically and mentally. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining us this evening. This talk is part of an ongoing partnership with Vitra Bathrooms, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank Vitra for sponsoring this series of events. Vitra have been working together with REBA to explore a wide-ranging survey of topics, projects, and innovative new ideas about the way society is rethinking the relationship between the built environment and our physical and mental health. We are obviously aware and know that our environment and the spaces we inhabit influence and impact our behaviour, our relationships and how we interact with each other, as well as our emotions and sense of well-being. As architects and designers shaping these spaces, it is not just about the functionality, but small details and features that enhance the environment, creating places that lift and boost our mood, and in some cases increase productivity, but overall improve the quality of how we connect with one another. This programme has already covered quite a broad range of topics, from how architects can integrate a biophilic approach not, to not only boost biodiversity as well as other environmental benefits, but also create spaces that are lighter and healthier to be in. We've also met with Abe Rogers and his award-winning concept and future vision for hospitals and how these spaces can help the healing process for all who visit. We've heard from architects who are creating spaces that are more nurturing, safe and welcoming for those with dementia. But fear not if you've missed any of these talks, you can catch them on the RIBA YouTube channel um, by searching the Wellbeing Well Built playlist. Um, we have one final event next in the series, um, which is a keynote from Carlos Moreno on his vision for a 15 minute city and a conversation with Catherine Firth, who is the director, of cities, a ci director in cities planning and design at Arup. This event will again be here at 66 Portland Place um, and is on the 1st of December, so we hope uh, to see you again uh, then. However, back to today's talk, and we are focusing on the importance of colour. And I'm very excited to welcome um, both a vibrant and a dynamic group of speakers to this event, and very grateful to Kevin uh, Haley from Aberrant Architecture, Morag Myerskoff, and Jason Danziger of Think Build Architecture for joining us this evening. They all use colour in very different ways, but through the spaces they create, they have transformed and designed playful interventions, not only for children, but also for adults. I also want to welcome and thank Justine Fox, who joins us this evening as chair and will facilitate a panel conversation and a Q&A from the audience following the presentations from our speakers. Justine Fox is a thought leader in colour and an expert in applied colour psychology and colour ergonomics. She is founder of studio Justine Fox, a specialist colour consultancy using unique psychological and commercial insights to maximise the power of colour to affect and support transformation. The studio works with clients on bespoke initiatives including colour research and development, experience installations, workshops and publications. The driving philosophy of the studio is that the power of colour goes beyond aesthetics and should be explored for its ability not just to enhance but to add value and impact to people and places. Now, I'd love to hand over uh, and welcome Justine Fox uh, to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, as Margaret said, uh, I work in colour, um, and I have done for the last 19 years, uh, cl working globally on commercial colour development, future strategies and experience installations. So I know that colour can often be siloed as a decorative afterthought, uh, rather than an integral element to our understanding of design. However, all, as with all sciences, our knowledge evolves over time. 
And as it does, we're learning that there's so much more potential uh, within this phenomenon than we're currently utilising. Colour is at the heart of our experience and understanding of the world. It's the first attribute that our brain processes when we engage with an object or an environment. And tonight, we're going to be tackling its influence in the serious business of play. The International Play Association defines children's play behaviour as play as behaviour, activity or processes initiated, controlled and structured by children themselves and it takes place whenever or wherever the opportunity presents itself and that along with the basic needs of nutrition, health, shelter and education, play is vital to develop the potential of all children. Now, play isn't solely something for the upcoming generations. The importance of playfulness in increasing positive emotions that can improve well-being and adaptive cognitive strategies within, uh, within adults is also now being understood. Recently, there was published a new study strong that strongly suggests that colour and emotion actually really are intrinsically linked. And what's really fascinating about this study that's come out of Vienna is that there's an incredibly high correlation of agreement across a global study, including people speaking 46 different languages. So that study found like an agreement of uh, emotion and colour at about 88%, which is phenomenal. So tonight I'm delighted and very excited to explore colour at play with some exceptional people who are using colour with playful purpose in their work. So I'd like to um, welcome Jason, Kevin and Morag. Um, they are going to do their 15-minute uh, presentations. Uh, Kevin is the co-founder of Aberrant Architecture, a multi-award winning collaborative studio of designers, makers and thinkers. Kevin studied interior design at Ravensbourne College and was awarded the future of design at New Designers, uh, after which he studied architecture at the, Royal at the Royal College of Art, where he was awarded with the Architecture Prize. Aberrant Architecture places storytelling and research at the heart of the practice, producing spatial experiences that are both meaningful and beautiful. Taking a participatory approach to their work, Aberrant build close relationships with communities in which they operate to uh, place people's needs right at the centre of their work. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, artist uh, Morag Myerskoff, and her work is characterised by engaging boldness, strong use of colour, and high levels of positive energy. She creates huge structural installations and immersive spatial works that champion community and public interaction. Her mantra is, make happy those who are near, and those who are far will come. Morag's contribution to educational environments was recognised in 2015 when her work with the architects Alford, Hall, Monaghan and Morris culminated in Burntwood School, London, winning the Sterling Prize for Architecture. Her work's been widely published around the world for her social approach and her distinct use of colour and pattern, often incorporating positive mes messaging. We also are joined by Jason Danzingham. He's an architect, BDA, an expert in user-centered and conceptually driven design. He founded Link, uh, Think Build, sorry, Architecture in Brooklyn, uh, New York, in the late 90s before moving to Berlin in 2000. His design explorations range in scale and theme from urban structures to furniture, color, and light, always with a focus on narrative, and the phone oh, I'm not going to be able to say this word, phenomenological and there, yes, uh, experience of the users. In 2015, he won the BDA Prize Berlin, and in 2016, he received a special recognition for outstanding health buildings, followed by an exemplary award at Karlsruhe City in 2018. Again, his work is widely published and he's lectured and taught at many universities. 
Thank you, and welcome to this evening. Uh, so first up, I believe we have Kevin. And so I'd like to welcome Kevin to the stage. Thank you. Hello. Uh, nice to see everyone here. I'm going to start my timer, so I keep to the 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, thanks for the introduction, Justine and Margaret. Um, so when I was putting together this uh, short presentation, um, what I'm attempting to do is just pick out some of the key themes I think might come up later on in our conversation and demonstrate to you how we work quite playfully and colour is a part of that process. So Abron Architecture, we would describe ourselves as thoughtful, playful placemakers. And we believe we reveal authentic stories about places and design spaces that inspire people to emotionally connect with their neighbourhood and community. Our work explores how we can rethink our, in, our entire idea of play and adopt, adopt a playful attitude to everything we do. We imagine play as a way of being in the world, blending some of those characteristics of play into our everyday experiences of work, shopping, or education. Using the power of playfulness, we believe we can transform buildings and reanimate public spaces to add to the life of cities, inviting people of all ages to explore and connect through playful exploration. So some of those uh, words we've highlighted in bold there are what I'm going to touch on now through some of the projects we've been doing. So the first kind of theme I've picked out for this talk is play every day. So that went there was the uh, Beacon Shopping Centre, uh, which is based in Eastbourne, if anyone knows it. Um, this was one of the um, starting points of this project. Um, the Beacon Centre now can boast of four different environments, which we describe as villages. People can meander through, through following this colourful, patterned river that you can see they expressed in the sketch. And a part of this uh, project is the idea that when we work um, with all of our projects, we go through quite an intense process before we even arrive at the idea of using colour, pattern, but it's very playful, the process we go through. So top left there, the image there is actually, and the, bo and the, bottom, and the bottom left, are historical images of Eastbourne's attitude to public space, and they wanted to be very ambitious, and they've employed an architect to go around Europe to bring back some of the best examples of public space. The top image is actually talking about the hamlets that originally designed in Eastbourne's, which was, it was divided into four separate hamlets, boasted of a different quality in their architecture, in their expression. And the middle image is the former river which Eastbourne is founded upon, which has been buried underneath the shopping center. So what we do is we kind of take these historical narratives and we begin to weave together a more playful outcome. And that was taking a large super graphic vinyl, weaving that through the center, recreating the languages of these hamlets and sort of embedding them with different um, approaches. On the right here, you'll see at the top right are these kind of amazing sort of uh, graphical drawings we found in archives which were kind of celebrating Eastbourne as a place to visit on holiday. The colours were very ama were amazing and spoke of the sort of feeling of the time. The bottom right is uh, Animal Farm uh, by George Orwell. Um, Eastbourne um, is, said, is said to... Um, 
He's based, based the farm in Animal Farm or on a farm in Eastbourne. He went to school in Eastbourne. So all of these ingredients come together to begin to create a playful story that, un, un, that unwinds in a shopping centre. And this was a really important project for us because a lot of the time we do do a lot of work inside of galleries and museums, but to take the ideas we're expressing and experimenting um, in places like that into a shopping centre and begin to sort of think about how can we reveal these amazing aspects of a place and allow people to celebrate place by, by using colour, by using playful approaches, was, was, is, a, is a new step for us. You can see here in these images here the kind of blend of you know, characters from George Orwell, um, the patterns on the floor, um, all of the forms um, that you see here are coming from an understanding of the former hamlets. The next aspect I want to really talk about is uh, Play for All, and we have another film. project there is um, of uh, Landscape for Play, which was built in Madrid for Matadero, and essentially was a former um, slaughterhouse a space, and the brief we had was to think about play. This is the plan of that space, which you can see um, there's colour, there's pattern, there's form, and very much one of the, part of our thinking was that colour becomes spatial, becomes territory, but also allows people to rift on top of this colour and this pattern, their own imagination. It doesn't dictate use, it kind of is an invitation, a stage for people to think about how they could use it. Some of that comes from, you know, this image on the left here, being a child, how you see the city, how you, this child here is kind of playing with the handrail, not how it's maybe supposed to be used, but how he thinks it could be used. Top right in Madrid, they have this uh, amazing map here of um, kind of institutions, people gathering together to set up their own um, play spaces in the city by themselves, which we thought was really, really inspiring. And the bottom right was we kind of fell in love at the same time with the work of Aldo Van Eyck, who had this kind of playful approach to public spaces. So once again, it's geometric forms. It's allowing people to rift on top of how you could use something. Um, and you can see you know, some of the, the results here. Um, it was amazing for us to spend time here and watch how people invented their own games. And one of the most important things uh, and interesting things to see was it wasn't just children playing, so adults would play. Um, it invited families to kind of make up their own uh, games or ways to use this space. You, you found that the sunken rooms in the middle of the landscape of play became very popular with the adults because they were then at sort of like eye height with their children. Um, lots of... Uh, um, um, we spent time talking to people to see you know, how they interpret the space and what happened as well, which we, was unexpected, the bottom right, was a local theatre group just took over the entire thing. So we didn't design it as a stage, but they started to, you saw in the film there, make uh, plays or respond to the space. So this thing that started as just about play became like this community asset. Um, 80,000 people visited it in the first week and it was a massive shame that we had to take it down. The last aspect I'm just going to talk about before I hand over is play uh, to imagine. So I'll say, just to explain this a bit more abstract, this film, this is a, a project for Arts Depot. The music you're about to hear is slightly strange. It's actually been um, written, uh, was written by the students we worked with. Um, so we worked with four schools in, uh, in North London. 
and um, essentially the project just started with exploring what architecture and what design was and for a process we were going to design something that was going to go in a gallery at the end of the entire thing. So we uh, essentially strapped a GoPro to our head and to the people doing um, the work with us and went to schools and we just started with a very simple question, where was the favourite place you like to play? So children would uh, draw it or they would model it through clay, picking out particular aspects but it was quite interesting to see as we went through different ages. We started very young kids that were very, used colour, used lots of different types of ways to express. And as we went through, um, the rubber started to appear, um, this, things were getting rubbed out. And then we took them onto SketchUp and we said, let's look at how we can express through SketchUp, uh, which a lot of people found very frustrating. Um, and the idea was that what came out was we were going to basically design a structure uh, where we would work with a material called papercrete. So paper is wasted a lot in schools, or that we found out. Um, and the idea was that each student, so there was about 300 people took part in this, would design their own brick, um, embedding onto the front of the brick the favorite place they play. And then we would go to the gallery and build the structure ourselves. So we were going back and forth to schools, um, this is us making a paper creep, um, and then you'll see pigment and colour going through. So the colour in this, uh, for instance, isn't, isn't applied, it's actually the material itself is the colour. I might let this run for a little bit more. We experimented as well, uh, some of the colour was um, made from food waste from the school's canteens, like berries are really good to dye. But essentially papercrete is reducing the amount of Portland cement um, to make a more environmentally sustainable concrete. These are the moulds. Um, so we took the, the children to Westminster um, University, showed them a the CNC cutter. Um, show them how you kind of translate sketch into SketchUp and how you can then like cut and make a bespoke brick. Mark, I think we're gonna have to stop the film there. Great. So just to finish off, what you don't see the rest of is essentially us kind of casting the bricks, um, kind of then transporting all these bricks to the, the gallery in North London and then essentially, um, I mean, this is a kind of summary here in some ways, and so is this drawing that we did here. Um, but the end result is this was the structure that was built. So um, every color relates to a different school we worked with. We even end up designing uh, lintels and put the school name in. Um, and it, on the surface of the brick, there was either a kind of a CNC uh, kind of cut mold, or we ended up actually putting in some of the plaster um, uh, the clay models the children are making. And then, you know, you see the sort of bottom right here, when the children came to the exhibition, we displayed the entire process. So it, nothing was wasted, and the, the entire structure was taken apart, and each part of this uh, structure is actually displayed at the school where it was made. So I'm just gonna kind of leave you on a few things, really. Um, and this is kind of our learning uh, from the idea of using color and play and really, it's more about this playful attitude we adopt with all our projects. And the first one is this idea of playfulness has personality. And quite often what we talk about is that if at the start of a project, you can actually work with the, user of the build, users of that building and you can strengthen their connection with the end result, actually results in this idea of emotional durability. So something can actually last longer the more you allow people to connect with it. And this is a school. Uh, based in East London, it was very much a part of that process. So we did workshops with the, the children, the parents, the school directors, everyone involved in, in this uh, building to end up with this kind of result. In the middle, the idea of playfulness celebrating place. So this is a tiny traveling theater that was built for Clark and World Design Week that celebrates a specific story about place. Um, you know, the, the roof is made from coal scuttles um, and you go, in, go inside this to have a, a kind of intimate piece of theatre. And it talks about London's first theatre that was built in Clerkenwell by a man called Thomas Britton. So extracting these stories and kind of playfully uh, reinterpreting them 
and making a kind of a traveling little device that moved around the streets of London was an amazing way to experience your place. Um, Playfulness is a stage. This is a project we did in Swansea where essentially it talks about a relationship that Swansea had between Valparaiso and Chile. Um, so on one side there's Valparaiso planted, on the other side there is an entire facade uh, made up of community coins. This relationship that Swansea had with Chile was because uh, there was coal and, or, or, uh, coal and copper being swapped, but because these voyages were up to a year long, the sailors had to go on, copper barons had to smint their own coins because uh, money was in short supply. So what we did was, um, at the back, the, you can't see on this image, but the, the entire facade is made from coins designed by people locally. The idea of it as a stage is so that people can begin to use it as a piece of uh, public art. It doesn't have to be looked at, it can be engaged with. So there's catwalks happen on here, people have picnics on it, bands, etc. I think the other idea is this idea of playfulness creates engagement. So I've, I've sort of touched on this, but it's this idea that most of our projects, I would say 95%, we really encourage uh, the clients to set up a steering group, to do workshops, sometimes to go into those workshops unexpectedly, not knowing what might happen. That's a really great place to be, uh, to make sure that we have uh, different opinions, different people in those workshops, um, because we really believe that, you know, if you, if you have playful engagement, it sets the tone for the project. Um, temporary projects are really good at that. People kind of want to be a bit more ambitious. Permanent projects, sometimes it's more difficult, but if you do, the, the workshop process can really set that tone. The middle one is a Christmas tree we designed for the v &A. It's made from recycled paper and plastic. Um, the whole thing comes apart and is turned into furniture. There's zero waste. So you can be playful with sustainability, how you think about it. And the last one is that all of our projects, we really want to make sure that it's for everyone. So we often think about you know, different sizes of bodies and how people want to move around, etc. so that very much this is not just the idea that colour and play is for a young, younger generation, it's for, it's for everyone to be involved in. So I'm going to leave it there. This was great, and thank you very much. So I think you can tell I like a bit of colour. And... Um, and, and I play with colour, I don't have any theories, I don't have any science to any of the colour I use, I just sort of do it from how I feel depending on the project. And, I, and it, a lot of it comes from being, um, being born and bred in London, I was born in, um, in Holloway in the 60s and it was really, really grey, I think they only put street, started growing trees in the road in the 70s and so... Um, I, you know, I wanted, I don't know, I've always wanted to have colour. I loved the carnival. I loved it when the um, fun fair came to town and the bank holidays and stuff. So I love putting colour on the streets. And fortunately, I've had an opportunity to do that. And this is my garden, my little oasis. And, and I've never had a real garden before. I've only had terraces. But now, recently, I have, I have moved out of London slightly, and I do have um, plants. And I, I'm obsessed with flowers. And sometimes I see my work as... Because um, I do a lot of temporary work, and it's often in quite extreme environments. And I see it as these flowers just coming up and then flowering and then it disappears, leaving no trace. Um, so this is a project in Aberdeen where by Look Again Festival, they asked me to come out. They wanted people to look at places in Aberdeen in a different way and this is a Mercat Cross. Um, so I worked with the community to do this Love at First Sight project that was a, a double narrative with my parents, but we're not gonna talk about that now because we're talking about color. But that, you know, that's a granite city. I mean, it's just amazing. It just wants colour. And what was so fantastic, once that was there, midwives came up to me saying, you know, that we love seeing art on the street. We love seeing the colour in the street. We want more of this. But the most important thing about this project, it was made by everybody. We made it together. So we, um, we did word workshops. We talked about colours. I made the patterns and the structure to go around the, the uh, Mercat Cross. And then we, I went up and I showed people how to paint. And then I left them to paint it so that they took on that whole challenge to paint the work, and, and that was another thing. When I was there, people were saying, mums and dads, I painted this bit, I painted that bit, and they, it's about belonging and ownership of the work. 
And this was just lovely. I realised also my mother's Scottish, and when I went there, I realised I was more Scottish than I thought I was, because um, there are lots of really good, strong women. So I wanted to show you this just because I'm very proud of this. This is actually a per well, semi-permanent, went up in 2017 um, for the first entrance to Battersea Power Station. And it was just next to the Battersea Pleasure Gardens, and I think I never saw... The, I never went and saw the Battersea Pleasure Gardens, but I think if I had, I would have been in absolute heaven because the pictures I've seen of it was amazing. So I wanted to make this piece that slightly had a reference to that and also a reference to the period of the Battersea Power Station. And I just love this sort of bit of colour among all this grey. And that's the entrance. And actually, they did like it so much, they've extended it for another three years. So I'm, I'm really pleased about that. And that's all hand-painted. So I think for me also, the materiality and the type of... Um, the, what, how you see the colour is really important. I think, you know, just digitally printing doesn't have depth of colour, and it's about how many layers of colour you use to give you that vibrancy. Um, this is a project that just literally came down last week, Hadrian's Wall. Um, I, I was given some places to choose to do a community project for 1900 years of Hadrian's Wall, and I chose Housted's um, Fort, which looks just out onto this incredibly bleak wilderness, and I just thought, this is the place for me, this is where we've got to make this piece of work. And it was on the site of a... Um, a gatehouse, the original gatehouse. So this is what I do, I play. I just play, I do sketches, I don't take myself too seriously. It takes me a really long time to actually do that, you'd be surprised. <laughs> it doesn't actually take a long time to physically do it, but it takes quite a long time to get it out of my body. And um, I wanted to recreate this, uh, this gatehouse to scale on the site of the original gatehouse and then I worked with the local community to make this project. And we um, talked about what wars meant, you know, what, why it was an opening. I wanted it to be a place that people could go through. We discussed it. It's their voices on this um, piece of work. And we painted it together. So it is huge. <laughs> And we all painted it together, and we talked to, again about what colours everybody and like. And people love when you talk to people; they love bright colours. They, you know, they, they. It make it makes them feel joyous. But people are very scared of colour as well. So, um, so this is the piece, and you can see it in the um, in the position exactly in the position of the fort. But there were a lot of people who thought I was like devil incarnate, or whatever the word is, <laughs> because this is a Roman fort that is grey, and you've put colour on this fort. But actually, I worked with the um, curators, and the Romans used... It was probably whitewashed, that uh, uh, gatehouse, because they wanted people to see it from a really long way away, and they had lots of colour. You know, they used lots of colour. It isn't as we see it here. So we should not always, you know be so controlled about our thought processes, about what is allowed and what's not. Um, and, and anyway, I, don't, I think it's good a bit of controversy, and I don't really care that some, certain people really, really wrote terrible things <laughs> on, on English Heritage Instagram, because um, actually, <laughs> they probably didn't go and see it. And when you, go and, when you actually look at things on a screen, or you actually go and experience the piece of work, it's a very, very different experience. And at, when you go in there, you, you, it was all about looking out as if you were guard in Roman times and standing at the height of the actual wall. So there's lots of layering. Sometimes people look at colour things and they go, oh, it's colourful, that's all it is. And a lot of people, they go, oh, we'll bring our grandchildren to see it, you know? And it's like, no, <laughs> look at it yourself. There's a lot more to it than you think. Um, this is Coventry. I was asked to do a piece of work in Coventry, Coventry City of Culture year, and I went to the city, and I was dressed like this, and I went to the Basil Spence <coughs> Cathedral, and it was so incredible. The, um, I know he's a famous... The, the artist who did this... And I can't... He's just left my head. Um, he did the uh, stained glass. 
And people in the street were stopping me and they were saying, I absolutely love your colour, I love the colour you're wearing. And I thought, God, people, you want colour in this city. So this was the, the bit of a shopping walkthrough thing, I don't know what it is really, the arcade thing that I was given. I, you'd, I thought this was done in the 80s, it was actually done in 2000, all this extra ceiling. So I, I, um, I decided I was going to give it colour. Um, and. Uh, this was the start of it, this was the first layer on, and there were so many people going, this is the most horrible colour, what is she doing? We're never going to walk through there again, it's so terrible. But then this is the final piece. So sometimes people should just, you know, they need to wait and they have to work with you and wait to see actually how the colour can change um, and, and be playful as well. So all this colour, and I, to be honest, I didn't quite know that the colour was going to reach the pavement. I knew the colour would go onto the beams, but I didn't know it'd reach the pavement. And it, it is absolutely beautiful when you go through there, even though I say it myself. And, <laughs> and, um, and it has changed that, that whole space, and people use it. It's very simple. It's not hugely expensive. It just changes. It makes you feel happy. It gives you a different feeling. I wanted to talk about materiality. So a lot of my work is painted, but this is a piece for um, the architects at HMM and its uh, broad gate, and they had refurbished one Finsbury Avenue, and I was given this middle space, and, I, and this was a permanent piece, and I wanted it to have uh, the materiality of it was permanent, so it's all mosaic tiles, all cut up, and um, everything is very carefully detailed, and so that the light reflects on it as well. And then the furniture, we handmade all the furniture in my studio, um, and, and, it, and put velvets in, and different uses of materials, so it has, it gives this sort of, uh, I don't know, I, I, for me it just says joy, and when you sit in it, I want it not to feel cold and austere, I want you to feel like you're, you're I don't know, you're being wrapped up by a blanket or something. So, um, hospitals. So, um, Avanti Architecture did, uh, di did the hospital at Sheffield Children's Hospital. I've worked in hospitals before, but I've never been allowed in bedrooms because bedrooms are very sensitive places in hospitals, and I didn't think, I think nobody thought I was quite sensitive enough. So, um, but I, you know, Avanti, they knew an artist was going to be brought in um, by the commissioners in Sheffield Children's Hospital, which Art felt um, would do this. So they're, they're not proposing that actually that space would look exactly like that in the sense of the colourway. They, they were doing that as a, a, a sort of a backdrop for me. So, I thought, oh great, I, I, what I wanted to do is make these rooms, so they were in children's hospital, but they were children to young adults, so I didn't want to make them for children, I wanted to make them for everybody, for the families as well. I wanted to make a place that was warm and like home, because sometimes people are there for six months, and I, or more maybe, you know, in the hospital continually. I didn't want people, I didn't want these young people to feel um, that it was all like crazy patterns or anything. I just wanted to feel like, like a nice cup of tea or something like that. But when I presented this to the staff, at, because there was a big room and all staff came in and they'd be, all been on shift and everything. They came in and it was shown on screen and I presented to them and they were all like nice to me and I was showing them all these different patterns and they were like nice, that's nice. And then the next day, um, Kat from Art Felt rang me up. She goes, Morag, they thought you were nice but they're not going to let you do the rooms because they're too extreme. And I said, OK, OK, I can understand. I was pushing them. I tried quite a lot of different patterns, and I wanted to see how far I could go. And then I thought, I said, yeah, but let's not just give up on this. Let's try and make this work. So I made these little models, because also I think it's really difficult. You're a nurse or a doctor. You're coming into a meeting. You're looking all these colors on the screen. How are you going to make that into three dimensions? How are you going to connect that across? So I thought, I know, I'll make these little models. I'll slightly tone down some of my patterns. I, I sort of moved, chose ones that I thought would work. I made these four different um, models. I sent them up, and then they showed them staff, children, you know, patients, and families, 
and 92% said yes, they wanted it. And I found out that teenagers like orange a lot, seemingly. <laughs> so, so then we went ahead and did them. In these pictures, I absolutely um, loved the videos before, but I can't have children in hospital. I can't have any children in hospitals, so in pictures. So that's why, for some reason, they decided to put Teddy on the bed. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. So um, and, a, and an elephant there. So. Um, so this is the thing, and it all has to be laminate, and that's why I introduced the wood to soften the colour as well, so that it, it, it took really a long time, it weirdly with Formica to get that laminate to work, but um, it was really worth it in the end. And then um, I also made these curtains, so to finish off the spaces so they had colour curtains, because you've got to also be really careful in hospitals. If you put things like... Um, I don't know, lots of animals, that can scare the children as well. But the one concession I did do is I made a blue room and, and the nurses were really brilliant because they said, if you make out of your 46 bedrooms, make me make us six blue rooms so that we can put any children who are very, very sensitive in those rooms first and then we can move them across. So we worked together to change that, which was really, really wonderful. I've got one minute left. So I'm just going to go through this. And there was this empty, there was this courtyard that the, this hospital couldn't raise the money for. And I wanted to make this courtyard happen. So I was working with Method Products and they gave me the money. And this has just been completed. So we built this outside space, um, all handmade for um, the children in the hospital to use. And it's a... Uh, you know, they can read, they can come out of their rooms, they can play, they can do whatever they want. And it's just to give them a really, uh, to give just a beautiful space for them, for contemplation and also for the staff, because during COVID, the staff were using this space with a big tent. So they were really annoyed when I came back and we, <laughs> we started putting these, this back. We wanted to build this this year. So we also made a space in the back here so they could sit and use the open space. So all staff and, and patients and everybody, families are together. Um, just going back to, this is, uh, this is one of my sketches for a project in Western Supermare. It's a co-created project with um, the community in Western Supermare. And um, it's, if you ever go down there, it's much better than the sea monster. So go and have a look at it. It's going to be nearly completed. And just to show you my commitment to colour, each time I go on holiday or on a talking trip or whatever, I um, always take photographs of my suitcase. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. And I'm Jason Danziger. And, um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about some of the background of how I work with color and what I've done with it. And I think a lot about <coughs> um, color as a catalyst for learning. So uh, uh, there's a little prologue about kindergartens and where they come from. This is uh, uh, Friedrich Frobel, who is a German guy from central Germany, and he lived in the um, sort of 1782 to 1852. And this prologue is uh, based on a book called Inventing Kindergarten by Norman Brosterman. So I, a lot of thanks to that. Um, the kindergarten was, uh, so I will show three or four kindergarten projects, but I thought it might be interesting to share at the beginning kind of how the idea of kindergartens developed just to show how I work with it. The Free Republic of Childhood. Um, that's a kindergarten uh, in 1900 in Los Angeles. And uh, the kindergartens were invented by Friedrich Froebel. He built on ideas about early childhood education from Pestalozzi, developed in, in central Germany. And um, the amazing thing about the kindergarten is that this idea spread very, very quickly all around the world. And um, the system was based on a structured series of 20 gifts, or Gaben in German, that started with balls, blocks, paper drawing, and modeling utensils. Um, and according to Brosterman, there are many notable Frobelian kindergartners, which included Paul Clay, 
Johannes Inten, Walter Gropius, Mies, Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, and many others. So interestingly, the kindergarten and early childhood education theories from this period have made a humongous, uh, very tremendous um, contribution to our cultural um, aesthetic. So that's the theory, and I, I believe this as well. And many of these ideas have started to form our ideas about play and color. So this is just a, a list. I won't go through it, but these are the 20 different uh, gifts. This is uh, from Milton Bradley, which is from Springfield, Massachusetts, which strangely is where I grew up, not in Springfield, but in another town called Northampton, Massachusetts. And uh, so there's this kind of uh, idea about how each of these gifts built on the other. And the first gift is, uh, was wood, wool balls, which were made in six colors. So there were the primary colors, um, blue, red, and yellow, and then three secondary colors. And the idea was that they would, they would teach the children how to kind of play with these things and touch and hold, so there was a haptic idea about it. And there was also ideas about color which were integrated in it. And so they, were, they had this idea that play was really an idea that helped people start to explore and learn. And um, I think that this kind of idea, you know, when you have these little balls out there and you're throwing them, you can make a game, you can, and, and I think the core ideas about abstraction can be found in these kind of uh, things very well. Um, the system is, is quite interesting, and I won't, again, I won't talk about it all, but the 12th gift, embroidery, is interesting because it, basically they, they would poke holes in paper and then they would sew just lines. So this became a way to learn about drawing. So this is for really young children, and they start to learn about how lines can become abstract representations of other things. Um, and then another gift is the wooden blocks. And so in the 1830s and 40s when he was inventing this, people weren't playing with blocks in the same way. We all do it. It's all something, it's something very natural for us. And I, I prob imagine everyone in this room has played with blocks at some point, maybe not recently, but uh, it's part of our, our life. And um, there's interesting things happened after that. So this is uh, Br British plastic toys. This is 1939. This was the, you might recognize this form and what this became. This was not uh, Danish. Uh, <laughs> at the beginning, it came actually from here. And um, this idea of how you would abstract things, make things, put them together, and of course, the place of color in this is very important. Um, this is an example which I find quite interesting, the 19th gift. This was made uh, here in London by A. N. Myers and Company in around 1860. And uh, again, it's this idea of the basic elements of drawing, and this is where it starts to become volumetric. And they would, they would soak peas overnight, and I haven't tried this, but they would soak them overnight and then add sticks to it, and you could make models. And um, this is a practical guide for the English kindergarten from London in 1855. Um, I don't know what happened to the Z, but whatever. It still works. And um, uh, Buckminster Fuller was a Froebel kindergartner. He's also from Massachusetts, by the way. It's funny. But he uh, writes, there's quotes from him talking about his early childhood education and how much that influenced his work. And uh, there are many other examples, but since I only have 15 minutes and I'm almost certainly going to go over, I'll stop talking about Fulbe. <laughs> um, so another really important uh, inspiration in my work um, is, is thinking about the body, you know, which we all have, and how it, how it can be used for play, and how when we move, uh, we perceive the world, and how when we're moving around, we unfold our understanding of the, of the space. And I think there's a lot of um, interesting movements also from a little bit later, but uh, Elfrida Hengstenberg was doing a lot of things about how children could play and things that became uh, involved in playgrounds 
giving, making small elements that children could use and construct things. I liked your slide, Kevin, about the child uh, using the railing. And I think children are great in reminding us um, how to be creative in, in our world. So this inspired me. This is a drawing that I made some time ago, also using SketchUp. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's a little chair. And this chair, you can rotate it. And uh, so, so children of different sizes, because that's one other thing about children, they change their size, you know. And so um, if, they're, if a, a smaller child could sit at a higher chair and a larger child, a little bit older, could sit at a lower and an adult could sit there or two kids could sit together and play a game. And the idea of making smaller objects means that the children are able to have agency in their space. They can change. The, um, their environment. And I think that's also a really important uh, w way of enabling children's play. So this is a photograph of a kindergarten that I uh, built, uh, the Farbwelt kindergarten in, in Berlin. And these are some of the chairs that I made there. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this project later. Um, so. Uh, this evening is actually about color, <laughs> so I maybe thought I would talk a little bit about color. Um, <clears throat> I use color as a material, as a building material. I think about it uh, like wood or steel or brick, and I also uh, work the same way with light as best I can. Um, so I, I really think about these things, and the really exciting interaction between the two is for me one of the kind of key elements of, of my work. And I find that that's where the phenomenology comes in, Justine. <laughs> it's about the, the experience of color, which happens visually through way that light touches colored surfaces. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I use color specifically in the projects. I think it's really important to try to put color to work. So I use it in three ways, generally speaking. The one is the phenomenon, which is the interaction with light, with light that I just said. I use color for orientation, which is a key element of identity. And I think that's really important in, in all architectural projects. And I think color is a very financially effective way to address the body and also change the proportion of spaces, which is very important, particularly if you're doing adaptive reuse uh, which is a large component of my work. Uh, so this is uh, from Linda Hotsu, who's teaching at Pratt in, in, uh, in New York, or not at Pratt, another school in New York. But basically, light hits a surface, and it bounces off. And then it, at some point, it arrives at our eyes. And if you place a surface color on, on it, then the light, the photons actually pick up the color and carry it elsewhere. So I work not uniquely, but a lot with reflected color as well. Um, and this is a really great trick, because if you do this, you can make a chicken green. And it actually uh, works. I, I haven't done like green chickens, but I've done a lot of different things and changed the color of things by doing that. And uh, I think it's interesting, because this idea of directly observable uh, occurrence is something really nice, because it's a sort of a democratic experience. Whether you're a, a child, an adult, or anywhere else you might be, it's something that we all experience together. Um, and I'm not, I'll admit, the first architect to work with these tricks. Um, this is uh, work from Louis Sert. I think it's just a great inspiration, this building. Um, and this is a photograph of the Soteria Berlin, which is a psychiatry ward in Berlin in an old building. And you can see that we painted the windowsill, um, the, the frame of the window, a color. And then the light comes in, and it carries it over and creates it. So I'll, I'll show a few more photos of that, too. Um, another very strong influence uh, for me is the Bauhaus. And this is uh, that guy in the middle there is Hinek Sherpa. And he made great drawings about color. He was one of uh, the Wandmalerei Werkstatt. So that was, they were trying to uh, figure out how to distribute colors in spaces. And they did these kind of drawings, which are unfolded. Probably you've seen these kind of drawings. But they're really great how they work. 
Um, this is a small house. And uh, basically, they would, you know, you could put a color on one wall, put it on the ceiling, and then another wall. And this strategy is something I've picked up. This is the Soteria Berlin. This is a psychiatric uh, ward that I built in an old building from the 1880s. And um, basically, if you put together all these plans, you can see how we distributed color throughout the entire ward. So it's a relatively small place, but we were able to create diversity. And I think, Morag, you were talking about how to do in different uh, character for each of these rooms. And I, I think that's a really massively important uh, issue in all institutional environments. And it's very different, difficult to do. And I totally agree that color is a great way to do that. Although I, I haven't been as courageous as you are, to be honest. <laughs> but maybe I'll get there. Um, this is what the drawings look like. Uh, the, just the painting drawings, and using this Bauhaus trick has been really effective. You can see uh, we just put the color in the window frame, in the windowsill, and the painters get it right away, and there's no difficult uh, negotiations on the building site, which is great. And they can also price it appropriately, too. Um, and this is a picture of the Soteria Berlin. And we also designed the furniture. This is built locally by joiners in Berlin. And uh, we kind of tricked and had different types of furniture, but all built locally in Berlin. I didn't design the chair. This is by another guy. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. And there's one other thing. Um, I will talk about proportion. So these, this is an old building. Adaptive reuse is a really important theme. And since this is a building from the 1880s, we couldn't put new ceilings everywhere. So we put a slightly dark color on the ceiling, and that changed the proportion of the room. So now I know I'm already over time, but I'm going to try to show three kindergartens super fast. Um, this is the Farbwelt kindergarten. It's another adaptive reuse. Um, so this was a building from the 70s, and we built in the ground floor a new kindergarten. And I think I'll just show really quick. We use color as orientation on these axes. Um, this is the color plan from the ground floor. Um, and you can see how. Uh, these rooms over here were kind of yellow, and because it's a really large building, 50 meters in length, uh, we thought it would be really important to give the children a way to intuitively understand where they are in the space. So that's the orientation use of color. Um, these are just little play games, phenomenology tricks inside the space. And um, so each of the cloakrooms has a different color that's related to the space, and so there's lots of little uh, places like this. And this is uh, just a few photos. Um, inside the space, we also left some open things from the building because it was a renovation. Um, and this is some graffiti that was on the wall because it was an outside wall before. And we also put some games inside the building. So there's a little uh, telephone here. That's Maria, and she can talk through this thing over here to Elliot, who's there. And so there are kind of like nice things that people can discover when they use the space. Um, there's Elliot again. And um, so I'll show another kindergarten. This was a very large building with a kindergarten for 100 kids. And we used color to create orientation. So eat, there was a large courtyard in the middle, which is the playground. And we did a, like a walkthrough um, cloakroom. And each of the groups had their stuff, and so we had a blue group, a green group, and a yellow group, and that was just to cut it down so they would understand where they were. Here's the color plan, and this is how it looks inside. We made a, a water exploration space as well. And uh, this is a, more of these spaces, the blue. And we worked a lot with transparency and kind of inhabited walls. This is what that looks like there. Um, this is the R90B uh, kindergarten. So we basically used only uh, in the NCS system R90B for this kindergarten. Um, and our idea was that we would uh, change the color at 1 meter 40 so that the children have a better understanding of scale. Um, this is the color plan. And so we always changed at 1 meter 40. So you can see here that. 
and, and we just sort of randomly place the different tones, so it's all different tones of this R90B, which I, I somehow seem to like. And we also designed the chairs and the furniture for this. And yeah, that's inside a little cave. And this is a final project. It's just a little bonus. It's a, uh, it's a um, healthcare project which is ongoing um, here in, in Norwich uh, with the NHS. And I'm working with Hooper's Architects there on this project. And this is a, uh, it's an existing uh, campus and these are old buildings that we are reusing. And basically we, did a, a consultation process with the service users and the clinical staff and came up with the clinical design brief together with uh, Hoopers. And our idea there was basically to address this issue of repetition and we tried to create different characterization on the, all of these wards. And in order to effectively build it, uh, we came up with not only using color but also typology as a way to change uh, the character. And there is an idea that um, according to how long the service users predicted stay, we would change the atmosphere in these wards. And so these are the three. This is the short admissions. And we had a base set of colors that is all throughout the entire hospital, which makes it easier for maintaining it. The estates people were happy with that. And, um, and then we had uh, changing colors here and there's differences of the rooms. And that's it. Incompleteness, there's always more to say about everything, but we know where it's going. And that's it. So, thank you. Wow, guys, that was uh, amazing. Is this on? Yes, it is. Uh, that was um, fantastic. Uh, I hope you all. Uh, enjoyed that and were thoroughly inspired as I was um, what different uses of color though um, that's something that I find absolutely fascinating uh, I think that for me I can very much see that um, the three of you are working in, in very different palettes in a way I'm quite interested in in the specifics of the colors that you're using, the types of colors that you're using. And um, I'm just kind of like wondering, in, in the colors that you've done, the projects that you've done, are there any that you've actually found that you've gone, do you know what, that color combination was amazing. And actually, I've had like such a good response. So it's something that you've kind of like taken, taken forward in your work. Anybody like to go first? I mean, I've, I've worked on so many projects over the years, and I used to get lot match pot paints, and I used to try every single thing. And then I have set on, actually, a certain set of colours that I use as a base colour, base colours of things, and then I change it by using pastels and various different colours in between. So, and sometimes... I'm not always so crazy on blue, so I take the blues out. And, you know, so there's... I have, but it's also very responsive to the particular project that I'm working on as well. So there's colors mean certain things to me, but then if I work on community projects or whatever, then I also respond to the colors that people want as well, and we try and work that in together. So, um, but the color that I absolutely adore is neon, and, and but neon changes your whole, uh, you know, visual. If you put, so these were nearly the same color, but they weren't quite, but now I put the neon, they look really different. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like, um, I, I like how color changes throughout the day, changes with light, how it reacts, you know. I, I, um, but I probably do have a set of my favorites. So you, you would probably start with those as a base and, and how people, I remember uh, seeing somewhere that you're talking about uh, your neons actually, mm. and how people responded to neon in kind of more of a surprising way mm. that you would think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they, 
I did the sisterhood stage this year in Glastonbury and I wasn't painting it myself and I'd specified that I had all these neons and the people were painting it and they were like going, are you sure you want it like this, Morag? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, when you do it, it, it just, because when the light goes down, it just glows and then if you put a bit of black light on it, it lights itself and then it has this whole nighttime experience as well, so... Yeah. I, I guess that is that it, isn't it? It's just it's not thinking playful's just like the daytime. It's how it then like translates into different environments and whether it's indoors or outdoors uh, and how mm. your experience changes with that. Um, how, how about you, Kevin? Is is there anything that you know you've come to discover with some of the colour relationships? Yeah, I mean I. I think, I think what's really interesting for us and what we enjoy a lot is when we see these unexpected things happen as a result of applying colour to places. So Jason sort of mentioned something that maybe wasn't an intention of um, some of the things we do in our projects, but this idea of orientation. So the Beacon Shopping Centre, I remember once I was going back through there, um, I go back and look at how our work is um, being received and I just love it when I hear people say I'll meet you by the green pig and how that's now become like a part of the local sort of vocabulary in some ways so that's really interesting or we did Rosemary Work School and children being like I'm in the yellow classroom or I'm in the blue classroom and things like that so colour becomes a way of talking which is really really great and I think sort of landscape for play the one in Madrid that we showed just hearing people like you know um, seeing families play together and people saying, no, you jump to the blue one first, then the yellow, and then you slide on the, on the green, you know, or how the colour becomes spatial. So it's, I, I couldn't say that any particular colour palette is, um, uh, you know, something that I personally love, but I, I think it's the idea of the, the, the criteria you begin to judge it on. And when you see people take ownership of the colour, like they've sort of connected with it, and now it's become a part of them, we absolutely love that. So, I think those when it comes embedded in their local community, almost yeah. like you say, like near the near the green yeah. pig, everybody knows. Or the big red chicken. You yeah. Know, like the <laughs> yeah. Or the, the green the chicken. Face. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the green chicken. Yeah. <laughs> You need yeah. to do some green chickens. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about you with some of those um, kindergarten uh, environments? I mean, the colour palettes that you're using in those environments are potentially like very different to say what Morag's been using and, and what Kevin's been using. Um, well, I, I really appreciate that there are no actual official regulations that I know about about colour. So I've it, looked for some. I can't find any. Yeah, I, I hope we don't make any, you know? And I think it's really interesting that it, it becomes something that you can talk about with people. And, and uh, that's something I appreciate about both of your work is you, you both spoke a lot about um, doing workshops and consultation with, with local people and the users and giving voice. And I think that color is an extremely lovely way to develop those conversations, which really need to happen. And through those conversations, people, the users, begin to take ownership of, their, of the project. And, and it's something, you know, it's not entirely cost neutral, but more or less, you have to paint it anyway. So you can, you can use these things in order to help people invest and begin to own the spaces they're going to use. So I like kind of stepping back. Uh, with color, but I, I do have some things I like, but that's just subjective entirely. Yeah, and be, because I, th I find it quite interesting in terms of, you, as you picked up on those, uh, those workshop elements, and I'm just wondering, like with the communities that you're working with, are they somehow leading the color, or is it kind of the dialogue that's leading your color choices then? How, how does that, and, and also, I mean, do they ever get quite surprised once they've been through that workshop process and then they see it at scale? Because that's something, especially when you start working with colour, that's something that can be quite um, a shock, I would say. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you can, sure. Um, um, well, when, when I do workshops, um, 
I, I do pattern workshops as well, so I introduce people to colour because people are scared of colour, particularly when they're older. They um, just think it's like something that children do, you know. So you actually have to sort of just get them more comfortable with colour and then they start realising, oh, wow, this is really enjoyable and they, they get really absorbed in it and then they feel that, yeah, they want to make this thing even more colourful or thought, you, you know, so it, it's all about trust and um, going, doing it together and, and, and making, taking people with you in the, on the piece of work. And then, the, then they, I don't know, it's just about understanding as well, because I think colour needs, is taken on face value and does need a lot more thought and um, appreciation than people uh, tend to give it. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, th I, think, I think I can sort of add to that the idea that the way we work is in these workshops is maybe we wouldn't necessarily talk directly about colour, but what we do is we sort of collect lots of things about what we might want to discuss. These could be objects, drawings from archives, and we ask people to select the things that sort of they're interested in. And then through conversation, what begins to come out um, is maybe there are like colors or forms of things that people are really attract, attracted to immediately and we begin to discuss that. And, and I think so, I think what uh, Maura is talking about is, is sort of, um, I feel like if I went into a room and said, oh, what color are we going to paint this? That, that it would, it would be somebody's like, mind. Yeah, but I think if we sort of uh, gently uh, <clears throat> go through that process with them, I think mm. it's, it, you know, you, you build that sort of emotional connection to what, to what you're talking about. And then I think there's another part of the process we find is that even though we might pick some colors together and we might, we might draw them up, how they then look in the space is a whole different, uh, takes on a whole different persona. So we then paint up samples. And when we did Rosemary at school, I think we painted up two different, 200 different um, samples of color. And then we had to then start applying to the walls. And then we started to think about, well, on a good day of light, it looks different. So spatially, it, is, it does become challenging. But I think you go from selecting a color to then actually applying it on the space so people can begin to see it, even though we can. So yeah, it's, it's about, I think these workshops are really amazing because they, you have a relationship the right way through. And so we're running workshops right the way through to the process. And even we do one at the end where we sort of like come together, we post reflect on it, yeah. think about what might you change, what might you add, et cetera, like that. So that, that, that's super important. But also taking people to see things mm. because you can't expect everybody that, you know, has been to a room that's completely yellow or this or that, you know, so actually if you also, because it's that physical thing about not, like you were saying, painting sections, not just looking at it, but experiencing it. So a room that is completely yellow affects you incredibly more than a piece of yellow on the wall, you know, and, and people need to, so they may be scared that, of yellow, but then it won't do the harm to them that they were expecting, <laughs> you know, depending on how it was applied. <laughs> I, I have a slightly, slightly different strategy with the color fear, because I've experienced this as well. And one of the things I do in many of my projects is I, I tend to use a lot of gray and then use smaller areas with more high intense, high chromatic reflective color. And, and I find it very interesting that when you go in that room, even though it's just one of four walls, people say, oh, the room is yellow. Yeah. Or they say it's green, and, it's, and, it's, it, it, and, and it's, it works because of this reflective thing, and people kind of pass by the gray, and then there's a lot less fear because they feel like there's not a big commitment. You know, it's just a little surface. Yeah. But I like people to commit, though. Yeah, I know that. I can, I can understand that. About you. I haven't known you long, but I, I, I can see that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's interesting though isn't it like mm. the where you put the color like you say actually like some uh, quite a lot of your work they are very small pos uh, propositions of color aren't they or they're placed in kind of the light well or, or somewhere quite or unusual or a structural system and, and people are still all like the floor pathway or I've noticed in some of your work Morag as well that it's very colorful on the outside and then when people walk through the space actually they're walking through the, 
the like natural wood material so they're getting that kind of different yeah. experience from it and yeah. um, we're just getting a little flash that we oh, are over already, time over. already. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to open it out to the audience. Um, so if somebody's got some questions, um, I would just ask that you wait to uh, get a microphone um, before you start speaking. Uh, but are there any questions out there? Would anybody like to oh, there's, start? There's one there. Down. Ah, here. Uh, to, to what extent do you think about uh, the effect of specific colors on people's mood or behavior? Like, are there certain colors you would never use in a kindergarten or a psychiatric ward or a shopping mall? Who, who'd like to get? So, would there be any colors <laughs> that you wouldn't use at all in a specific situation? So, in a, in a shopping centre or kindergarten or hospital, are there any colors that you would absolutely steer away from just because of the kind of psychological or uh, you mentioned um, wanting the blue space, didn't you? Maura? Well, I've been told not to use certain colors, mm -hmm. but I don't agree with it. So. I've been told not to use red um, with autistic children, but again, it's about the percentage of red or what the red's next to or where it is. Or So I think when people put those blanket health colours onto your work, I'm not entirely sure if it's based on anything in particular or it could be based on a really tiny study that then removes that colour from, from the colour spectrum. So, um, you know, I mean, I don't particularly think a blue room is particularly... I, don't, I think it's quite cold, a blue room, whereas maybe I'd find a more orangey room warmer. But, you know, there are certain times where you do have to give people concession that that's what they believe. Um, I, I think I, I agree with you disagreeing with that, um, <laughs> but I, I don't, I find it actually interesting um, that I think that people bring a lot of color with them when they go into spaces and they inhabit spaces. So even though I, I uh, as an architect, I'm putting color in, in an environmental sense, particularly in kindergartens, children their clothing, you know, it's an industrial thing. Their, their artwork. Their, 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 exactly, their artwork. Their, they bring a lot of color, and so I find it interesting to not put too strong colors in it. Although the R90B kindergarten was a bit of kind of a trick. It was just an experiment, and I was, I was very happy to have a, a client who let me go for that, but, uh, or let us go for that. But the, um, I think that be, I, I don't, I haven't understood particularly that any color is bad. You know, I don't think that's true. And I also strongly agree that colors have a great uh, contextual dialogue. You know, they talk to each other mm -hmm. and they do stuff. And so a, the colors don't exist in a, in a vacuum. So you sometimes need things that aren't good in order to get the good stuff to sing. And, and I guess it is, it's that understanding of, uh, individuality as well you can uh, obviously you have to work in general terms and more like saying about the red but um, you know I, I did some work with a, a sleep consultant and, and we were talking about the best colors for sleep and she was saying you know if you have a child who has uh, who is autistic then really you want to be looking at colors that are their favorite and you just like you say you take that proportionality down or you take that saturation level down and actually it's that familiarity or something that they love that actually soothes them, soothes yeah. them mm -hmm. relaxes mm -hmm. did you have anything to add i mean i would just say that i mean we wouldn't you know apart from i mean i agree with most of the comments here i mean if there was something hazardous you know and color was making it obviously we wouldn't do that but I think it's a part. It's a part of the conversation, which is which is great. You know, this immediately is you know, a lot of time we deal with clients that we've gone through a process, and right at the end, someone will get a call and say, "Should we just paint it white?" 
Should we? Should we? Should we? And we, we, you know, and I understand the fear. I do understand it. But then we, you know, we go back through, you know, reassurance of the process we've just been through, and you have that conversation again. And I think also it really helps the fact that we go back to the spaces we do, and we spend time there, and we learn. We learn Watch. from that. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, I'm open to discussing why a colour could be perceived as like bad or good, but ultimately, I, I think it comes from a, an immediate fear of what will happen if we paint this green, yellow, and blue? Are people going to not come here anymore, or things like that? So once you get past those conversations and you have a process that also, I think, like something more active there, when you make a model and you put the colour on, you can't start making it more spatial and people get more comfortable with it, etc. I think you know that. Why should there be any rules, really, if it's not going to hurt anyone? I, I think as well, it's that it's that concept of well, as well of when somebody might say, "Don't paint the wall green." You know, what green are you talking about? We could all have a plethora of greens in our head, and you know, if you do a little bit of Google color psychology, you'll get, "Oh, gr green is restful. Green mm -hmm. is calming." Uh, but go out and have a look at a real acid green and you'll get a very <laughs> different experience and mm. so I guess part of it is is that kind of language the the storytelling that that goes with it as well and and making sure that the color that you're using is a, a, appropriate contextual and dependent on the space or what you want it to do it's you know getting it to to work it's an amazing tool so getting into work a bit harder for you. Uh, are there any other questions? There's uh, somebody just down here. Thank you. I just have a curiosity question. I, there's been a lot of new commercial office space, for example, being built over the last you know, five, 10 years or so. And I don't know to what extent your businesses is involved in, in that part of architecture, but I'm just curious if, um, color has been embraced in the commercial office space because at the end of the day it's people working in places or, or do you still find and I know I'm going to make a stereotype here that let's say a Google might embrace color in their workplace a lot faster than a, an investment bank for example hmm. thank you I could say I, I, um, I actually recently had a client, I, designed, I did a whole building and I did a renovation of this office space for 80 people and um, I, I obviously I worked very hard on the color and uh, right at the end they said no we're going to paint it white and they did it, which is a catastrophe, that's a <laughs> word that works in German and English and every language, many languages anyway. and, and uh, I couldn't, I couldn't get them out of it. And then they, they, or they, they went and built these kitchens in it with these really strong colors because they felt it was too sterile. And so I was like, okay, you know? I guess, uh, what's the lesson of that? I, I think the lesson is um, it's really critical to maintain these trusting relationships that you're talking about, you know? And I think that, uh, giving uh, clients confidence that it's okay to do that and h helping them through experimenting by building models or finding ways to communicate with them and maintaining that is really critical. And whether it's an office space or a kindergarten or a home uh, you know, of any scale, I think it's really kind of a key thing. That's the lesson I keep relearning, unfortunately, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 at the end of the day, it's about people, isn't it? And, um, y you know, when you look at, like, pure white spaces, they can be quite sterile, quite unfriendly, quite clinical. And, and that's probably why they felt, oh, we need somewhere that's going to give us, like, a little boost yeah. in there because people are probably exhausted. Already, yeah, but they though. didn't, yeah. <laughs> it's about them trusting. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's really it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was, that, was, that was a rough one. That one. I, think, I, I think there's a... I mean, the, the, the question I think you're asking, I think I just want to add to what Jason was talking about, is that, um, so we're just, we, we're working on a project in Spain in office, and one of the challenges of the client, the reason they came to us, and they said that we were colour experts, was the one, the conversation was, the, how do you entice people back to the office after what's happened, and we don't want to commit too much, and we've been working out of WeWork uh, for such a long time, etc., and, 
color's a really great place to start with that, how you can begin to change an environment that becomes like a pool for people to be a part of, but actually moves away from this sort of cookie cutter kind of approach in design that maybe you could argue we work suffer from at points. So I think, I think, I think potentially this idea of sort of bringing color in into the office could be, you know, we could end up uh, having these most amazing sort of environments that start to really celebrate the uniqueness of, of that place and the, and the people behind it. So I think that's what we're trying to do and it's, uh, and it's gonna be a, an interesting process, but yeah. Bringing people back in. Um, so unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time now. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers. Jason, thank you very much. Morag, amazing. Kevin, fantastic. Uh, fantastic. And um, thank you to the audience as well. Thank you very much to Vitra Bathrooms uh, for sponsoring this amazing Reba event. And thank you, Vitra. Thank you very much. Thank you.